For this story to make sense, you must know what I do for a living. I study entomology, insects. The pay isn't phenomenal, but it's a field that I have been passionate about all my life. I specialize in the study of moths. I won't force you to read or pronounce my formal title. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. What matters is that I study moths, their diets, their reproductive habits, and their role in pollination. My research has taken me to half a dozen countries, and I've studied over 50,000 species of moth. By all accounts, I'm an expert. For the account in question, I only needed to travel to Nevada. It was a 10-hour drive from my California home, but I made the most of the wind and the radio. I was expecting the trip to be routine. I was wrong. At the time, I was documenting the relationship between the Tetigula synthetica and the Joshua trees of the southwestern United States. In Nevada's Tikaboo Valley, two varieties of Joshua trees have come to coexist. To my knowledge, the valley is the only place in the United States where this has occurred. I remain convinced that the synthetica moths have played a role in the unification of these two tree species. My plan was to travel to the valley, establish a campsite, and to monitor the presence and behavior of these moths over the course of three days. I settled on the southern side of Tikaboo Peak and elected to face my campsite west, toward the sunset. My first night passed without incident. The following afternoon, however, my studies were interrupted. The approaching rumble of an engine announced the intruder's arrival. It was an M151 military-grade truck. On the road, it would have looked out of place, as if it had just slipped out of the Korean War and landed on the highway. On the mountainside, though, the vehicle looked right at home. Two military personnel, I wouldn't call them soldiers, jumped out of the truck and introduced themselves. As they spoke, loud and aggressive, they paced my campsite. They were more interested in my equipment than what I had to say. I had the necessary paperwork to prove my intentions, of course. I knew that the military's Air Force range was nearby when I agreed to take on this particular study. My documentation seemed to satisfy them. They wearily agreed that I could stay. The nervous glances they exchanged told me that something was amiss. I was more worried about my insects at the time, so I chose not to press them for information. They left and warned me not to document anything occurring beyond the perimeter of my camp. I agreed to those terms. I had enough moths within the immediate area to gather the information I needed. The second night, I saw what they wanted to keep a secret. A loud electronic pulse resonated through the area. It shook my equipment and scared away the moths I was watching. At that point, I had no choice but to surrender to my curiosity. I looked to the west and saw that another truck, this one much larger, had parked in the groove between two hills. A long bed was attached to the back of the vehicle. Upon that platform was something that looked like a satellite dish. A red bulb was blinking in its center, and after every few beats, another wave of sound radiated from that direction. It was loud but low, like an alarm that was meant only to be felt by my bones. This went on for two hours. My research for the night was crippled. Then the light blinked off, and in the darkness, I lost sight of the vehicle and the satellite dish. I'm not sure what that equipment was. I do know, however, that something responded. The next night, the sound came again. This time when I looked, there was no vehicle hiding between the hills of the desert. There was no light on the ground either. This time, the lights were in the sky. In the distance, a large triangular mass was hovering in the air. It must have been 500 feet above the previous location of the truck and the satellite dish. Lights were flashing from the corners of the triangle. I thought at first that I was hallucinating. I thought that the darkness was concealing the true nature of the structure in the distance. It couldn't be floating, I said, certainly not without the growl of a motor or the whirring of a blade. But there it was. With each strobe of the red lights, I saw the edges of the craft become more defined. It was larger than any vehicle I'd ever seen. A dozen of the military's M151s could have parked on the back of the mysterious craft. Like before, 
After a sequence of lights had concluded, an electronic pulse rippled across the desert. This one was stronger. I heard the sound, and a few moments later, I felt the wind push against my hair. I watched the shape for an hour. Then it turned, pointed one of its corners toward the sky, and vanished. It blinked out of existence as quickly as the satellite's red light had been turned off the night before. My study, I decided, was over. I left immediately. Instead of finding the open road, I found the military waiting for me. Different personnel this time, more of them too. They were carrying rifles, and not one of them looked glad to see me. They didn't ask where I was headed. They didn't ask what I had seen. Instead, they told me. They told me the desert air was a little too harsh on my lungs. The nights were a little too cold. I was headed home. I hadn't seen a thing. I didn't have a story to tell, except for the one about the moths. I would have agreed to anything to get out of that situation. My reputation was damaged after I failed to complete my research. My study wasn't published. Grants have been harder to come by. As I sit here now and watch my career decline, regardless of my undying passion for the work, I find myself asking, why not? Why not tell the story? It isn't anything new. We all know they exist. I guess, maybe, the shock lays in the rest of that truth. Not only do they exist, but they're communicating with us, and we are communicating with them. I signed up to work for a freelance security firm to earn some extra cash before the holidays, and I'd worked dozens of jobs without any issues until this happened. I got a call early in the day from my recruiter telling me they needed emergency help because this ins usual guy quit effective immediately. They sent me the address and I went in. The front desk workers showed me what I was supposed to do during the night. I had a station in the lobby across from them. I was supposed to act more like a deterrent for crime than anything, and I had to do a round through the inn every two hours to make sure everything was all right. Seemed easy enough. Not long after I settled in, the desk attendant started making small talk. I'm not much of a talker, so I answered in short responses to try and signal like, hey, let's just enjoy the quiet. Some time passed and out of the blue he said to me, this place is haunted, you know. Of course, I had to ask more about that, but when I did, all he said was, I'm sure you'll see it for yourself soon enough, then laughed as if it was a normal thing to say. I left to do my first round. I brushed off what he said. I've always been skeptical, and some crazy old receptionist wouldn't change that quickly. The inn was only three stories, with ten rooms available for the guests to stay in. I walked up the first flight of stairs and cleared the second floor. Then I walked up the second set of stairs and began walking down the hall. I couldn't explain it, but something in me was on edge as soon as I stepped foot in the hall. A chill came over me. I felt the hair on my neck stand up. It was quiet as I walked to the end of the hall. I made it halfway back down the hallway, then I heard a thumping from above me. It was loud and sounded like it was coming towards me, like heavy footsteps running almost. I stood in place and looked at the ceiling while I listened to the noise. The sound finally reached where I was standing, and just as I was expecting it to move further away, it thumped three times right on top of me. As soon as the thumping stopped, I heard a slow creaking noise from behind me. I turned around, and the door to one of the rooms I'd walked past had opened. I didn't want to go in. I wanted to turn around and leave. But it was my job for the night, and I had to check it out. I walked to the door and knocked on it before I opened it all the way. I yelled, hello, to see if anyone responded. I was hoping a guest might have heard the thumping and peeked out to see what it was. No response. I opened the door all the way and turned on the light. There was no one in the room, and it didn't even look like a room they would have guests in. All of the furniture was covered with white sheets, and the pictures and mirrors were off the wall, facing away from view. I couldn't understand how the door opened. 
I tried to rationalize it. Maybe the vibrations from the thumping opened it, or I stepped on a loose floorboard. But it didn't make sense. I closed the door and left. I made my way back down to the lobby, and the receptionist was still there, looking at me with a small grin. He asked me if everything was all right on the walkthrough. I asked him how many people were staying on the third floor, and he told me that only one couple was staying at the inn, and they were on the second floor. I was clearly confused by that information, and he asked me what happened. I told him. We chatted about some other strange occurrences that had happened at the inn until my next round. Apparently, people have reported seeing shadowy figures. They've heard knocks at their doors, and no one was there when they answered. And many people have said they've had vivid nightmares. I was apprehensive about my next walkthrough, but I had to do it. The second floor was fine, no disturbances to report, but the third floor, once again, was noisy. It wasn't thumping this time. I could have sworn I heard crying. I froze when I looked down the hall. The same door was open, and I know I closed it. I approached the room slowly with my hand on my taser and turned on the light. The crying stopped when the light came on. I walked in and looked around the room. I didn't see anyone. I called out for whoever was in there to come out but I got no response. I walked to the window to make sure it was shut and locked, but as my back was turned, I heard the door slam. I immediately dropped what I was doing and rushed to the door. I opened it and walked out of the room. At the end of the hall, I saw her. A woman stood in front of the stairs with her face in her hands, like she was crying. My heart fell to my feet and I froze in place. Thumping noises began above me again and rapidly made their way towards the woman. The door to another room creaked open, and she walked inside. I ran down the stairs back to the lobby without looking back. I told the receptionist what I saw, and he nodded his head. It wasn't a new story to him. I suppose this is why the other security guy quit on such short notice. I've been waiting for this trip for months. Every little thing had been planned, right down to what I'd eat each night. Since I became a resident of Alaska, I've dreamed of this moment. A solo hunt into the heart of bush country to track down a bull moose. Flying into the area where I would hunt, the weather was perfect. A secluded area that I doubt many people have come to. Many parts of Alaska have seen few, if any, people at all. The pilot and I agreed we'd meet back at the exact location in four days. Hopefully, this would be enough time to hunt down a good-sized moose. The only thing I worried about was if I would get one sooner than later. I'd have to smoke the meat somehow to protect it from spoiling. This year's weather had been unseasonably warm, and the above-average temperatures threatened to ruin my hunt. There wasn't anything I could do about the weather, but I could at least make the most of it. The first afternoon, I glassed a little bit near camp without success. There wasn't a ton of grizzly sign, which made me hopeful. Trying to preserve the meat would be hard enough, a task made more difficult by the threat of a black or grizzly bear sniffing around camp looking for an easy meal. That night, all two hours of it, I slept peacefully in my sleeping bag. I was unaware I had a visitor to my campsite, but it would have been odd if a bear didn't visit my camp. Based on the tracks along the camp's perimeter, a young grizzly visited. Fortunately, it only seemed curious, so it left me alone. On the second day, I hiked to different hills to class the surrounding areas for any moose. At one point, I saw a cow moose off in the distance, but that was about it. At a different time, I spotted a lone cabin about two miles away from my camp. I was surprised to see any indication of other humans in the area. I wondered aloud if they were around or if it was a hunting camp for an outfitter. I made a mental note to keep an eye out for anyone and to keep an eye on the cabin. Some people can be very protective of the area they hunt in. I certainly didn't want to upset anybody, and more importantly, I didn't want to miss out on bagging a moose. 
I spotted a grizzly off in the distance as I walked back to camp. It must have been that younger grizzly, but it was still a dangerous animal. I kept an eye on it the whole way back to camp. I made sure to hang up my food high into a nearby tree and cooked all of my food away from camp. Certainly an inconvenience, but every measure was essential to ensure my safety. That night I was restless. I knew the grizzly was probably near, but it hasn't bothered me. I kept my handgun close at hand just in case. The following day I saw the bear about a hundred feet from my tent. As soon as I spotted it, it took off on a dead run. At this point, it was more scared of me. Hopefully, it would stay that way. It was my last full day of hunting before the pilot returned for me. It was crunch time. Within a few hours, I spotted a nice bull moose about a mile from camp. I made a mental note of its location and began to stalk. The underbrush was thick, which slowed my progress even more. By the time I finally reached the location of the moose, it had disappeared into a stand of spruce trees. I decided to set my tripod and wait it out. Within ten minutes, my decision paid off. The bull walked right out into the open, and a single shot brought it down. I said a small prayer of thanks to this beautiful creature and started processing the moose. I would need to take several trips to get the meat to camp. All the while, I needed to keep an eye out for the bear. Halfway through the processing, a figure approached me. It was the man that lived in the cabin that I saw yesterday. He heard the shot and decided to investigate. He was a friendly guy and offered to help. There was only one peculiar thing about the man. He had a long, jagged scar from his forehead down to his cheek. His right eye was a milky blue color. Around his neck hung a claw from a grizzly bear. He told me it came from the one that gave him his scar. With the help of the man, I could get everything back to camp in a few trips. As a thank you, I gave the man a quarter of the meat, because I didn't need that much meat anyways. We parted ways and I started packing up in preparation for the next day when the pilot arrived. I slept easy. A ripping noise roused me from my slumber and I immediately knew it was that damn grizzly. I grabbed my gun and my boots. The grizzly was standing on his hind legs and a paw gripped one of the meat sacks. That's when I noticed the long jagged scar and the milky blue eye. I aimed and took a shot at the grizzly. With a roar of pain, the grizzly ran off into the underbrush with one of the meat packages. A wounded bear is dangerous, but I wanted to ensure I finished it. I began to track the bear by following the blood trail until I came across something that made me stop dead. The bear tracks turned into human tracks. I know it sounds crazy, but the tracks did turn into human tracks. One can see the transformation as the thing walked. One track had the heel of a man and the claws of a bear before the claws disappeared for the next track. I recalled my grandmother's story when I was a young lad. There were powerful people in this world that could transform into any creature they wanted to, just as long as they had a part of an animal with them. That memory made my blood run cold. In the distance, I could hear the plane approaching. It was time I left this godforsaken place and left it behind for good. I didn't know what was happening, but I didn't want to stay either. I didn't say anything to the pilot other than that I had the worst luck. I told him a bear stole two-thirds of my kill before I could chase it off for good. I didn't say anything about the bear turning into a human, and I wouldn't tell another soul. Well, at least until now, anyway. I worked for the National Park Service for three years. I wasn't out in the trees, though. Unfortunately, my story isn't going to be that exciting. My official title was Administrative Specialist. I helped organize government-funded programs and prepared written documents related to those programs. I was good at my job. I was fired unceremoniously 15 months ago. I wish I could say that my removal from the service was a mystery. I know exactly why they let me go. I saw too much. 
12,307. Even though I know it's higher now, that's the number I remember. I couldn't scrub it from my brain if I tried. For eight months, the Science and Research Division of the Park Service was collaborating with an independent study group. I handled the paperwork for this partnership almost exclusively. Waivers, NDAs, population registries for the fauna in our country's national parks. There were some odd additions for sure. Why were the members of the Park Service signing liability waivers? Asking those questions wasn't part of my job. I didn't know enough about the Science and Research Division to begin a debate with them either. I trusted that the Park Service knew what they were doing and tried not to get hung up on the details. Then the injuries began. I'm not sure when they started or how many people were hurt before I became aware of it. The first few incidents, I know now, only involved the study group that I mentioned before. Without members of the Park Service involved, I had no reason to be notified. When the first ranger returned from the Everglades with a broken leg, I started paying attention. The ranger was part of a team documenting the population growth of the Virginia possum. I'd never heard of a possum breaking someone's leg. I had to file the details of the incident along with an insurance claim and a copy of the liability waiver signed by the ranger in question. That's how I knew the doctor had cited the source of the ranger's injury as an animal attack. That's how I saw the pictures. The ranger was mauled. When I started asking questions, I was only reminded of their official position, documenting the population growth of the Virginia possum. There were three more attacks over those eight months. I knew by then not to announce my suspicions. Whatever was going on in our parks, no one wanted to talk about it. Instead, I stuck to the documents. When the research project concluded, it was time to bid our independent partners farewell. I had to provide them with original copies of every recorded incident related to their research. I did exactly as I was told. I prepared the pile of paperwork, and when I was asked to combine it with the folders brought into the office by the independent regime, I didn't hesitate. But I couldn't stop myself from peeking at their information either. The corner of one specific document was protruding from the edge of an unlabeled black folder. It must have come loose from the paperclip holding the rest of the folder's contents together. I tugged it along until I could read the heading. Unidentified Species. I remember how cold I felt when I read those words. The sweat on my brow turned to ice. I didn't know that the Park Service was involved with anything involving new or unusual forms of wildlife. I pulled on the paper a little more. Information spilled out of the folder one line at a time. New encounters. Seven. There was a range of dates alongside that number. Those seven new encounters had taken place over the research period that I was involved in. Injuries. Nine. The Park Service had only four documented injuries. The other five, I suspect, belonged to the independent company. Why had they kept that a secret? Where were those injured parties? Total encounters, 12,307. My heart sank. There wasn't a range of dates next to that line. I didn't know how long this company had been studying unidentified species in our jurisdiction. Had the Park Service been involved from the beginning? Why weren't these encounters, these injuries, or these new species being discussed with the community at large? I lost my composure after that. All discreet intentions vanished. I opened the folder where it sat. My eyes briefly passed over a collection of photographs. They looked to be screenshots from the trail cams. One of them was a Polaroid. In each picture was a shape that I didn't recognize. Animals for sure, mammals mostly. They were either moving too fast in the photos or my glimpse at them was too brief but I couldn't decipher any of those species. A hand suddenly slammed the folder shut. 
He was a member of our science and research team. When he spoke, he did so in a hushed panic. He told me to forget what I saw and urged me away from the area. I later saw him handing the folder and my paperwork to a member of the independent party. They were scared when they caught me. I doubt that they were worried solely about my safety. I think the knowledge that I gained at that moment could have put the entire park service at risk. That's what's so frightening. What could they do to us, a government body? Who has superiority over the park service in the parks that we manage? My termination arrived swiftly after that. I expected it to be accompanied by an NDA, but there wasn't one. I guess the administrative specialist that they got to replace me overlooked that detail. I can't be punished for sharing this information now, can I? I know that these parks are dangerous. They have been for years. But... Am I in danger too? I remember the night vividly. It was damp and brisk. We had just had a rainstorm, but it was one of those summer rainstorms that made everything warm but cold. You know the types where the wind is what makes you shiver? I had been called out to look for a dog that was roaming a neighborhood near the cemetery. The cemetery wasn't big, it was actually pretty small, but the dog had been scaring some people in the area. I was part of the animal control team. We had plenty of experience handling stray dogs, so it wasn't an unusual call. The only thing that seemed odd was that people said the dog was extremely massive. So to me, this sounded more like a wolf than a dog but we can't really make assumptions. We were told to go locate the dog and bring it into custody. I hadn't been to the area before. It was a strange town that was very remote, but it was still a type of suburban area. I could definitely see why a large canine would be threatening to the people there, but I still had my suspicions that we were looking for something that was not a domesticated dog. My partner and I drove around the town, There were lots of small shops, most of them seemed to be family owned. A couple of candy shops, an ice cream shop, some pizza, things like that. Truthfully, it was making me hungry, so I wanted to find this animal quickly so we could finally get some dinner. I remember telling myself that I'll have to remember this place because I'd really like to take a stroll around here on one of my days off. We didn't find the canine near the shop, so we started combing the neighborhood close to it. It was hard to see much. Many of the homes had plenty of bushes and trees. I wouldn't doubt if we'd been in the same vicinity as the hound, we just couldn't spot it. So we drove back and forth, up and down those streets. We had spent at least an hour and a half doing this. We were starting to get a bit frustrated. That's when we got a lucky break. One of the people in the neighborhood must have seen us driving their streets aimlessly, so they flagged us down. The man said that he had seen the hound roaming near the cemetery on the south side. I asked him how big the dog was. He said that it was extremely large, that its fur was pitch black, and they noticed its eyes were glowing like a deer caught in the headlights of your car. We thanked the man and proceeded to drive towards the cemetery. The cemetery was very small, but it had plenty of large trees and bushes, just like the neighborhood. It was getting darker, so things were made a little more difficult. It wasn't normal to do this, but my partner and I decided that we might have a better chance of finding it on foot. That way we'd be able to scavenge around the bushes and trees and use our flashlights. We were both nervous. If the canine was as big as everyone said, we wouldn't be very safe out in the open. And if it was, in fact, a wolf like I had thought, We wouldn't be in a very good position with it. So we stayed close to each other. I did bring some things to our defense, whistles and things like that. We circled around the outskirts of the cemetery first. We just needed to get a good look around the perimeter before we went straight in. We didn't see anything at first. We just assumed that it might have left the area. But then as we started to head back around... We see a black mass sitting in the middle of one of the streets between the neighborhood and the cemetery. 
and all I could smell was that fragrant, burnt smell of an old campfire. I yelled to my colleague, but I kept my front facing the canine. I didn't want to take my eyes off of it. At first glance, the dark mass seemed to be average-sized, but as I continued to examine it, I noticed that the canine was actually laying flush to the ground. It wasn't standing. My colleague asks if I think it's a dog, and I told him that I wasn't sure, that it was still a bit too far for me to make a proper estimation on the size of the animal. That's when the mass stands. It was indisputably large. Its eyes are glowing, just as the man said, and it slowly walks to the neighborhood and disappears. It walked like we were not any type of threat whatsoever. It was smart, this animal, so we had to be extra careful. We followed the animal's path into the neighborhood. We looked around, but we didn't see it. But what we did see was a strange black smudge, and it was very large in size, and it appeared to be on the spot where the hound was sitting. It smelled like charred wood, but there was no sign of the animal. It was getting really late. We were exhausted and hungry, but we knew we had to get this animal off the streets. But after following an animal that seemed to simply vanish from our sight, it seemed like we needed more eyes. We made our way back to the van, and I called for more assistance. We had another team meet us, and we searched more. I had described the animal to the other team. They looked confused, but they didn't suggest that we had been fabricating anything. We searched well into the next day without ever finding another trace of the hound. Eventually, my boss called and said it was time to leave the area, that the animal must have moved to a new territory. We were never called back to find the animal, so I often wonder whatever happened to it. After college, I got a temp job working with local law enforcement. It was a six-month contract and it paid well, so I was glad to get it. I found a furnished apartment that let me rent month to month. It was on the top floor of a three-story building. It was pretty big and had nice hardwood floors. The walls were kind of thin and I could hear my neighbors sometimes, especially at night when it was quiet. When I first moved in, I knocked on the neighbor's door a few times to introduce myself, but they never answered the door, even though I thought I heard them inside. I figured they didn't like answering the door if they weren't expecting somebody. Anyway, I slipped a note under the door just saying hello and giving my name. I worked with the same officers all the time on rotating shifts. After I'd been there a few weeks, I was on the evening shift, which meant I got home around 2 a.m. One night, I was heading down the hallway of my building and saw a light coming from under my neighbor's door, and I saw the shadow of feet under the door. It looked like the people had gone dark as if they heard me and were looking to see who was in the hall. I figured if they wanted to say hello, they would have opened the door, so I just kind of waved and went to my apartment. Over the next couple of weeks, this happened three or four times. Seemed like I had a reclusive but nosy neighbor. One night after work, I got into bed and heard my neighbor moving around in their room on the other side of my bedroom wall. The noises got louder and I started getting worried. They had never been that loud and it almost sounded like they were being attacked or having a heart attack and knocking things over. I ran out and banged on their door, but they didn't answer. I called out saying I was worried and if they didn't answer, I'd call for help. Still no answer. I ran to my apartment and called the police station and asked my coworker to send someone over. I headed down to the lobby to wait for the officer who showed up within five minutes. I'd gotten to know him a bit and we went up and knocked on the door, but still no answer. I took him into my apartment and we could still hear loud thumps every five or ten seconds and then a huge bang. The officer asked if I could contact the building manager to open the door. I called her up. Luckily she was a night owl and she was up watching TV. I told her what was happening and she said she'd head over. She lived close by. She got there and asked which apartment it was. 
I told her 306. She looked at me weirdly and said, 306 is empty. I said I'd heard my neighbor making noise almost every day. The officer said he heard the noises too and asked if 306 was the apartment that was above the carport. She said it was. He said someone could have climbed up onto the carport and maybe there were squatters in the empty apartment. The manager unlocked the door. The apartment was dark and she turned the light on. The officer went into the bedroom and came back saying it was empty. The place was spotless. All but two of the windows were locked and there was no sign of squatters. We just stood there, confused. The officer said, You're not crazy, I heard the banging too. I said maybe we scared them off and they'd left through the unlocked windows. We locked the two windows and on our way out I looked down and saw the note I slipped under the door a few weeks earlier. I said I'd let them know if the noises kept up. A few weeks later, when I was on the evening shift again, I got home about 2 a.m. and saw the light under the door of 306. I went into my bedroom and heard the thumping next door. I called for an officer to come out and called the building manager. A different officer showed up and I knew him too. The manager arrived and unlocked the door. The officer went in and everything checked out. All the windows were locked. I apologized and tried to rationalize it, but there was definitely no good explanation. A few weeks later, the apartment was rented out, and I got the chance to meet the new neighbors. I told them to keep an eye out because we thought maybe squatters had been getting in. I told them what had been happening. My last week there, the station had a barbecue, and we were talking about the squatters that no one ever saw. I told the first officer about the second call and how the windows were locked that time, but I knew I'd seen the light on and heard thumping. He asked if I wanted to hear something strange. He said he was going to tell me earlier, but didn't want to freak me out. He said that three months before I moved in, he personally responded to a call to my neighbor's apartment for a suicide. The man had hung himself and was unconscious. It seemed like he might have panicked and a chair and lamp and side table had been knocked over, like he'd been kicking out in every direction. Unfortunately, he passed away before getting to the hospital. I just stared at him in disbelief. I asked the building manager about it the day I moved out and asked why she hadn't told me. She said that it was just policy not to bring up stuff like that. I don't know if it would have helped or not to be told about it, and I still can't even believe it. I used to spend almost all of my time out in the wilderness about 10 years ago. I worked as a ranger in the Bridger Teton National Forest. A lot of my time was spent on horseback. We managed the Teton Wilderness Area. It's almost 600,000 acres of wilderness, and the only way to manage it effectively was to use horses. It's a very wet wilderness that has a lot of river and creek crossings. I was going along the river on horseback one day, heading for an area where we were working on a trail repair. We were on a familiar trail that was one of our favorites. My horse loved it. That general area was a good workout for the horses as it had a lot of natural obstacles like fallen logs for us to jump. And my horse loved to splash in the stream. My mare was a little temperamental though, feisty, always taking in everything around her. She was always very alert. But that day, she started feeling more agitated than feisty. She was dancing around and didn't seem to want to move forward. There was definitely something that had her attention that she didn't like. I couldn't see anything between the trees that would have upset her. I didn't hear or smell anything. But horses have very keen senses, and it isn't unusual for a horse to be aware of something you're not. I figured there were people walking somewhere through the trees, or maybe an animal I couldn't see. I tried to urge her onward, but she wouldn't budge. She just kept dancing around on the spot and trying to spin around like she wanted to go back the way we had come. Then suddenly, she went stock still, 
I could feel every muscle in her body locked tight and tremors were going down her spine. She was ready to bolt. She had raised herself up to her full height, head up, ears pricked up, nostrils flared, and she kept snorting. And then, out of nowhere, this thing darted out in front of us. It ran out on all fours and stopped in the middle of the trail. Then it stood up on its hind legs and just stared at us. It was about 20 feet away from us. I hadn't had any feeling or hint that there was something in the trees, but when it sprang out, I felt instant dread. The thing we saw was not animal or human, though it had a very human shape. When I say it ran on all fours, imagine a human bent over with hands and feet flat on the floor. It had disproportionately long arms, and it was really thin and spindly. It was way too thin to be human. Its head was wider than its waist. It was hairless as far as I could tell, and its skin was a grayish-brown color that made it blend in with the forest. Everything about it was disproportionately long, like all its features from fingers to toes had been stretched out. When it stood up, it was tall. It seemed to be about eye level with my horse. I'm not sure if it's because of the distance between us that I couldn't make out facial features, or if it just didn't have facial features to make out. I can only remember big black eyes staring at us. I imagined if I touched it, it would feel rough. The skin didn't look smooth, but not really scaly either. It stood like it was ready to tackle someone. I got a good but brief look at it, because in the next moment, my horse spun around and burst into a gallop from a standstill. She galloped back up the trail. I was so shocked and freaked out that I didn't try to stop her. I think I actually urged her on while holding on as tight as I could. I don't think the thing chased after us, though I admit I didn't dare look back to see if it was. But the horse galloped like the fires of hell were after her. Only once when we were back at the trailhead where there were some other people did she stop. There's no way I could have stopped her if I'd wanted to. The people at the trailhead gawked at us, suddenly bursting off the trail like that. Even though my horse considered the place safe enough to stop, she still kept her attention on the trail behind her. She kept staring in that direction, wide-eyed and snorting. I don't know if the thing was lurking in the tree line or what, I managed to ride her back toward the stable, but it was hard to calm her down, and she seemed to be in shock. We went on a long trot in the opposite direction to burn off some of that nervous energy. Later, my supervisor kept saying it must have been a deer with chronic wasting disease or something. Obviously, if you hadn't seen that thing with your own eyes, you'd be grasping at straws. I really don't know what to make of it. I don't even like thinking about it. I've spooked myself just telling it. I don't understand how I'd never seen any sign of such a thing before, and then all of a sudden there it was right in front of me. Over the next several weeks, we gradually started to feel a little more normal, but I seriously think both me and my horse have lasting PTSD from that event. Looking back now, it all started with one goat. It was a year ago when I lost one of my prized goats. Some animal had killed it. I chalked it up to a predator attack, typical for farmers, especially new farmers who didn't have their shit together. My fences were not the best. In fact, they were terrible. Most likely, a coyote came at night and quickly dispatched my goat, and obviously something disturbed it before it could start eating. That would be the only reason why a coyote would leave its kill. I was so overwhelmed with grief and regret that I overlooked the obvious. There wasn't any blood. It's easy to see my mistake when I look back, but that realization might have helped me sooner. However, I didn't, and soon I had a crisis on my hands. The first goat was older, so I chalked it up to natural causes. I found it near the end of the pasture. There were no signs of predation because I didn't see the two small holes on the neck of the goat. 
I'm positive they would be there now after seeing what happens to the victims. The next goat was a younger buck that put up more of a fight. There was blood everywhere. The wound was jagged from the flailing goat. I heard the commotion while on the porch admiring the stars overhead. By the time I got to the goat, it was already dead. There were tracks nearby, and they were unlike anything I'd seen before. There were three toes and individual scales on the feet that made marks in the soil. I knew they were reptilian based on my biology classes in college. However, these tracks were enormous. There were no native species that had tracks like that, and I'm not even sure non-native species left tracks like that either. After the second goat was killed, I installed electric fencing, which seemed to work. I didn't have any incidents until about six months later. By then, my guard was down, and the electric fencer crapped the bed one hot night in August. This left my herd open to attack from the obviously intelligent creature. I noticed it had tested the fence several times previously because of the alien tracks left behind near various sections of the fence line. It had been about six weeks since I noticed the last set of tracks, so I figured it had finally moved on to a neighboring farm. Again, I was outside admiring the stars on the porch when I heard the goats were obviously in distress. My heart sank and a cold sweat broke out because I feared the worst. I knew the fence was on its last leg since I bought it at an auction earlier in the year, but never in a million years did I think the damn thing would return. It goes to show how naive I was as a new farmer. I quickly grabbed my gun and ran toward the noise. It was a clear night and the moon was out. I couldn't believe what I saw when I got to the goats. Two goats were sprawled on the ground, dead already, and a third was fighting off the creature. It was a creature I had never seen in my life before. The creature was reptilian for sure. It had brownish green scales that shone brightly in the moonlight. It had round, dark eyes and sharp teeth. Most notable were the two long canine teeth that punctured holes in the victims. I then realized that the creature drank the blood of the goats rather than eating the flesh. The canines tore the flesh into jagged streaks as the goats twisted against the creature's bite. Along the back of the creature were spines like a bluegill. The creature stood about three feet, but it was extremely muscular. It was able to subdue the third goat as I watched in horror. I stood frozen as the creature sank those canines into the goat's neck. It began to lap the blood with its forked tongue like a dog drinking from the water bowl. Its eyes rolled back, showing the whites as it took pleasure in the feast. I couldn't move, but finally, a scream escaped my temporary paralysis. The scream drew the creature out of its trance and immediately squared up and began to hiss at me. It was displeased that I had interrupted its feast. I mastered my fear long enough to raise my gun to shoot whatever the hell it was, but before pulling the trigger, it ran off into the long grass near the fence line. I stayed with the herd the rest of the night to protect them, but sometimes I feared for my own life. I held the gun tightly throughout the night and would nod off now and then before rousing myself to be vigilant. Once the sun rose, I immediately took care of the carcasses of the slain goats and then repaired the fence enough that it would run for the day. I'd go into town to buy a new one to protect the herd. Before heading into town, I did a quick internet search to find out what I was dealing with. I quickly narrowed down what the creature was. According to the search results, I was dealing with a chupacabra. There were numerous sightings of the beast throughout the southwestern United States into Mexico and other Latin American countries. Others posted about their experiences and I found out numerous people experienced the same thing I was going through. It became clear that once the creature was spotted, it disappeared. I hoped this was right, but I wasn't taking my chances. It's been several months since the day I spotted the chupacabra. My herd is safe, but I remain vigilant. I hope I never have to see the evil creature again. I've pondered if I should move, but what if I can't escape it? For now I remain. 
waiting. I had the worst bus ride of my life recently, and not because of the reasons you'd think. I moved to Cincinnati to go to the University of Cincinnati, but that didn't work out too well, which is why I really wanted to go home to my family's place, just outside of Detroit. So that all led to me getting a ticket at the last minute for the bus that left at 5 p.m. I get car sick real easy, so when I got on the bus and everyone else was looking at their phones, I wasn't. Can't stare at that little screen when I'm in a moving vehicle unless I want to feel like garbage. After we passed through Toledo, there wasn't much around, hardly even towns anymore. I was getting bored, just listening to music on my phone and tired. So you can see why at first I thought I was just imagining things. I kept seeing this bat-like shape in front of the highway street lamps, swooping and diving like it was flying, but trick flying, you know? And I thought, okay, I'm tired, my brain is making this up, it can't really be there. But I kept seeing it, and I had this thought that it was following the bus. I thought that when we stopped it might attack, which was weird. I mean, because I felt like that idea came from outside of me, almost as if this thing was telling me what it was going to do. I closed my eyes for a while, hoping that when I opened them, it'd be gone. It had to be, because this made no sense. But when I opened my eyes, it was swooping toward the bus. I couldn't deny that it was there. I looked around, but everyone else was focused on their phones or a magazine or whatever. Then we came to the next stop, which was Monroe. I couldn't wait to get there because I was sure the thing would go away once we got to the city. Monroe's not a real big town though, and just one person got out at this deserted station. No one was around and it was sorta of late by then, at least 8pm. As we pulled away, I saw the thing standing by the streetlight, leaning against it, just as cool as it could be. Maybe if you glanced at it quickly, it looked like a person. It was person-shaped, but that's where the similarity ended. The wings were folded up behind it, and I could see the ends of them. I could tell they were big, as big as it was, and it was at least as tall as a person. It had no face at all, and red eyes. Those eyes were looking right at me, like it was marking me, noticing me maybe planning me as its next victim. I hunched down in my seat and pulled my hood over my head, but it still felt like it was looking at me. I was scared, but I didn't know what to do. All I could hope was that it would get tired of waiting for me by the time I reached Detroit. I knew how crazy it was to think it was waiting for me. Why me and not anyone else on the bus? And maybe it wasn't. I thought maybe I was just the only person looking. But I felt it, like I knew it was waiting for me, and I was terrified. I tried not to look out the window anymore, but it was hard because I kept hoping I'd look and it would be gone. I'd glance out, and there it would be, swooping near the lights. At the next stop, Flat Rock, I decided to switch to the other side of the bus. There were plenty of empty seats by that point, so I did. I doubted switching seats would be enough to fool it if it was looking for me. If it didn't follow me though, then it probably wasn't looking for me. For a while I didn't see it and I started to relax, but just as we hit the suburbs of Detroit, I saw it again. Now I wasn't getting off at the station downtown. There's a stop at the edge of town and that's where my brother was supposed to pick me up. I wondered if the thing was going to attack me the second I stepped off the bus. As we got close to my stop, it disappeared again, but I didn't dare relax. Sure enough, as the bus rolled up to the bus shelter, I saw the thing, standing by the nearest streetlight, cool as could be, and I didn't see my brother's car. I texted him and he said, running late, there in a few. My darn brother is always late. He was born late, my mommy used to say. But this time, if he was late, that thing would get me. The bus pulled up and stopped. A few people were getting out. Like a coward, I waited. Let them off first. 
I had a feeling it didn't want them, and they did seem to be okay walking off towards cars or other buses. Finally, I had to get off. The parking lot was right behind where the thing was standing. I stuck my hands in my pockets and casually walked away from it, keeping to the edge of the lot. It followed. I picked up the pace, not running because I had nowhere to go. When I saw my brother's car pull up, I broke out in the fastest run I've ever done in my life. Just as I was within a few feet of his car, I felt wings whoosh by my head. Something grabbed my shoulder, but I shook it off and grabbed the door handle. Slammed the door shut, just as something hit the car window, hard. What was that? My brother said. Just go! I yelled. As we peeled out of the lot, I saw the thing fly up toward the light again. I didn't even try to explain it to my brother, and we have never, ever talked about it. I'm with an extremely high and extremely clandestine level of government. I will not give my name, title, or job description. Some of the following may already lead back to me as it is, and if I'm discovered as a whistleblower, well, my life is forfeit. Throughout your elementary school science lessons, you probably spent some time learning about some of the basic features of our world. Crust, mantle, inner core, outer core, etc. For the most part, these teachings are correct. There is, however, an extremely significant piece of information missing. Depending on which agency or nation you're dealing with, it goes by a different name. I'll refer to it as it's most commonly called. The Stygian Layer. Over a dozen miles beneath the Earth's surface is an entirely alien ecosystem. This is not a hollow world theory as portrayed in media and literature. There is no inner sun or lost civilizations. The world below us is a series of globe-spanning tunnels, cavities, and caverns, which exist in a state of absolute perpetual darkness. You would need to speak to someone more informed than I on the specifics. But the open tunnels allow air to circulate throughout the system, cooling down what should be an area well into the hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit. The danger is not the existence of the Stygian layer, but rather the creatures that inhabit it. From the multitude of samples we have collected, the creatures native to the Stygian layer are life forms dating back hundreds of millions of years. Over several of the Earth's eras, the immense pressure in the area has caused drastic abnormalities in these species, resulting in several life forms developing near indestructibility and the ability to hunt prey in a completely lightless environment. Other unknown effects have resulted in remarkable attributes, some of which are completely unexplainable by any scientific discipline at this time. You may ask why this remote and foreign realm has been kept hidden from the general public. I'll explain. If you've listened to other stories on Mr. Dredd's channel, or have read about bizarre or unexplained events and encounters online, then there's a strong possibility that the culprits of these incidents originated in the Stygian layer. On occasion, fissures will open up along the Earth's crust, which results in an entry point for the creatures below to emerge into our surface domain. I can't confirm that creatures like the Loch Ness Monster or Sasquatches have their origins in the Stygian Lair, but I can say that it's entirely possible that these, as well as a vast majority of cryptids, have their ancestry rooted in the dark depths of the Earth. As part of my employment with the U.S. government, I act as a form of liaison to other similar organizations across the planet. A small portion of the world's nations, actively and in concert, strive to keep the existence of the Stygian layer completely unrevealed and classified, react to and eliminate or capture emergences of creatures from the Stygian layer destroy or otherwise block known entry points to the Earth's surface. When this isn't possible, 
to defend and secure entry points. There are three active and known entry points in the northern United States. For reasons of geologic stability, these entry points cannot be permanently shut. One along the northeastern coast of Canada, one in Central America, and one in the deserts of the western United States. There are only three entry points out of a total of 18 worldwide entry points that we're aware of. It's believed that at least one, if not more, species of creature has the means to efficiently drill into the earth. This necessitates a perpetual state of vigilance to quickly identify and respond to any new entrances created. We have about a 63% success rate of predicting where new entry points are emerging. This leaves a 37% fail rate. When these creatures emerge, human lives are in an absolute state of danger. There have been instances where entire populations of remote towns and villages have been laid to waste by a single entity from below. On five occasions in the past decade, our organization has responded to crisis-level events within our own country. During all five events, creatures numbering in the high hundreds successfully infiltrated the planet's surface causing widespread damage and loss of human life. Great care is taken to obfuscate the true nature of these events. Natural and man-made disasters are falsely cited as the cause of these events. It's further believed that there exists a species of hyper-intelligent and sentient reptilians that are evading detection as they ascend to the surface. The idea of subterranean reptilians is also something that's been portrayed in the media, as well as being a component of several conspiracy theories. We have absolutely no confirmation that any of these reptilians are capable of mimicking human mannerisms or appearances. It is thought, however, that these creatures have drastically different technology than our own, with its foundations in the manipulation of organic material rather than hard components. For reasons of global stability and physical security, this has all been kept hidden from you. I'm sure you could imagine the sheer panic that would spread like wildfire should it be discovered. If a hostile nation or terrorist organization were to somehow gain access or control over the creatures from the Stygian lair, it could quickly result in an apocalyptic scenario. We don't know the total population of the creatures below us. We don't know their full capabilities or intellect. We don't know how many have successfully made it topside. We don't know if government officials have been compromised. We don't know how many entry points exist. The number of instances are rising. Decade after decade has seen an alarming escalation of minor emergencies as well as crisis level events. I alone now believe that the public must be made aware of the constant state of danger that we unknowingly live in. It's only a matter of time before a situation occurs that cannot be contained. I implore you all to seek the truth and to begin demanding answers from your public servants. Be vigilant. Be prepared. I was never really someone who was too interested in camping or the outdoors, and after this story, I never want to do it again. My brother talked me into joining him and his fiance on a weekend camping trip. They're both avid hikers who love nature and live a very granola lifestyle. I'm pretty much the exact opposite, but I agreed to make my brother happy. We got to the campsite and set up our tents. It was about midday by the time the camp was all set. We had a fire started and we were setting up the grill to throw on some burgers. My brother suggested we go scout out the area and look for cool hiking trails and photo spots. I'm a photographer and I suspected I was going to be roped into taking their engagement photos. We set off and started hiking through the woods. Nothing was out of the ordinary, for him at least. The woods are very foreign to me already. My brother has always had a weird habit of making weird random noises. Like he'd beep boop and stuff to make sound effects for his movements. 
I thought I heard him making tiny clicking noises while we were walking, which was a new noise for him, but I didn't think much of it at the time. We found a really beautiful cliff to take some photos and made a plan to come back later for some nice golden hour shots. We got back and ate some burgers and talked for a while. I got to know his fiance a bit better. After eating, we hiked back to the cliff. I got some amazing shots of them, as well as some nice landscapes and nature shots for my own portfolio. Honestly, I was starting to enjoy my time outdoors. After we returned and chilled at the camp for a little bit, his fiance wanted to walk to this little spring she'd heard about and swim. I was tired and didn't want to walk that far, so I told them to go without me. I was relaxing on the ground, staring at the sky and admiring the stars I rarely got to see in the city, and I heard the clicking noise my brother was making earlier. They'd only been gone for 15 minutes or so, and I expected them to be gone for an hour or more. I called out for my brother and didn't get a response. All I heard was a quiet rustling in the leaves. I called for them both again and waited for a response, but all I heard was the clicking noise again. At this point, I kind of thought my brother was trying to scare me since I was so out of my element there. I yelled out again and told him that it wasn't funny. I knew he was just trying to scare me, but he didn't stop, and the rustling moved closer. I sat up and looked toward the woods where I thought I heard him. It was dark and hard to make much out, but towards the ground I saw something white moving, like snow white, translucent white. Not my brother. I stood up and grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight. When I lit the area, whatever it was stopped moving. I froze in place as I got a better look at it. I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. It was ghostly white with four long, thin limbs. It was crouched on the ground with them all sharply bent. It almost looked like a freakishly large spider. I heard the clicking noise I thought my brother was making come from this thing. I got a brief look at its face when it looked up at me. Its eyes were hollow and dark, and its mouth was hanging open. I can still hardly comprehend what I was looking at. After a few seconds of staring, it lunged at me. I was able to dodge it, but I fell on the ground doing so. It's almost like it moved too fast and wasn't able to stop itself right away because it had to skid to a stop. I stood up quickly as I could and ran to my brother's car. Thankfully, it was just us out there and he left it unlocked, with the keys sitting right on the front seat. I put them in the ignition and turned the headlights on so I could see if this thing was coming at me. I got one last good look at it when I turned the headlights on. It looked... human. Like someone was walking on all fours. It was naked, but I didn't see any genitalia to distinguish it as male or female. And its face was thin and virtually featureless. I knew I needed to call my brother and make sure he was okay. This thing lunged at me, so I didn't know how dangerous it was, or if there were more of them or, or what. I was worried, but being the clumsy idiot that I am, I dropped my phone when I hit the ground. Against every molecule in my body telling me to stay in the car, I jumped out and ran to get my phone to call him. When I stepped out of the car, I heard the clicking noise again, just in the woods, like it was there, watching me, waiting for me to leave. I ran back and called my brother. He didn't answer the first time and I started to panic, but I called again and he answered. They hadn't seen anything, but when I told him what happened, they rushed back. I made them help me pack and told them we had to leave. When they were back at the camp, I didn't hear any clicking, and I was listening extra close for it. It hit me on the drive back that it was following my brother and I earlier, and was probably waiting for an opportunity with one of us alone. I never heard of the Jersey Devil until I moved to the Pine Barrens a couple years ago. I live in Chatsworth, New Jersey, the unofficial capital of the Pine Barrens. All around the little town, there's blueberry fields and cranberry bogs. 
People sit around talking in the local diner, and I started hearing stories about the Jersey Devil. Supposedly, it's lived for hundreds of years, I guess because it's a demon. Some of the stories are pretty convincing. Folks talk about its scream the most and say it's a terrifying sound, like a tortured woman, and dogs and livestock getting attacked. The Barrens is a pretty creepy place. I don't go in there at night, but I've been during the day and seen the old houses, just standing empty and deep woods. You can imagine anything could be living in there. So one day, me and some other people got hired for a job to tear down an old abandoned building in there, outside of town. Guess some rich guy bought the land and wanted to build a mansion on it. We went out to look at the site, and one guy quit right away. He said he ain't tearing down nothing in the Barrens. I asked him why, and he said, The devil don't like it. The devil? I said, thinking he meant the dude underground. The Jersey Devil, he said. Well, I needed the money, and it wasn't nothing but an old barn. Six of us stayed on. The first day, we just brought in all the equipment. Had a big bulldozer and a dumpster. We started by just going inside and hauling everything out. Old troughs, saddles, rusty farm equipment. Nothing weird happened until we were getting in our trucks to leave. We heard a loud screech. We all looked at each other like, did you hear that? We all did, and we all knew it wasn't good. But we didn't talk about it, just left. The next day, one of the crew didn't show. Said he was sick, but I wonder if he was scared. I didn't blame him. I went though, and we finished hauling the stuff out. It took longer than we thought it would, and we filled that whole dumpster. There was a lot of crap in that barn. So we had to get the company to haul the dumpster away and empty it. I figured we wouldn't get anything else done that day, but the company wanted us to stick around in case they were able to bring another one. So we all sat around and ate lunch. I asked the guys what they thought the noise we heard was. No one said anything. Finally, this one woman said, It was the Jersey Devil. Come on, guys, you know it. Lots of protests, but they didn't sound convincing. Then we were just sitting there, and we heard the scream again. We all just sort of froze. One guy got in his truck and left. He just took off. The rest of us sat there, staring at each other. I mean, it was the middle of the day. The foreman came back and found us there. He must have thought we were crazy, but he just told us to go home. Two guys didn't show up the next day, so there were just three of us left. Luckily, we were ready to start the actual demolition. Really, we just needed one of us to drive the bulldozer and the others to pick up stuff. We went to work, and within a few minutes, Kenny and I heard the scream. We were the ones picking up stray boards and junk while Jane ran the excavator. She probably didn't hear it over the engine, but we sure did. I didn't know what to do. I was thinking I should get in my truck when this thing ran out of the forest. It was the scariest thing I've ever seen. Its legs were all crooked, and it walked hunched over like. The eyes were the most horrible part, red and glowing and just... evil. It had wings, too. Like bat wings, except you could see the bones. You could see its bones all over its body, like its ribcage popped out. The head was goat-like, but also a skull. It screeched again as it ran toward us, and we all bolted. I was so scared I couldn't get my keys out of my pocket. I dropped my keys on the ground, and the thing ran toward me, like it knew I wasn't going to make it in time. But I scooped up those keys quick and pushed the button. I never heard such a wonderful sound in my life as that door unlocking. I jumped in, and that devil was right behind me. It threw itself against the window, and I thought it might break it. I jammed the key in the ignition, started the truck, and gunned it. But then I saw the thing going for Kenny. I turned the truck in that direction, thinking maybe I could hit the thing. Kenny was running for his truck, which was on the other side of the excavator. I couldn't get around there to get to him because of the dumpster and some debris in the way. All I could do was watch. 
Jane was still in the excavator. She was trying to hit the thing with the bucket. She couldn't, though, because it was too fast. I thought she was safe in there, but she needed to get out because she couldn't stay in there forever. I drove my truck up next to it and she got the message because she jumped out and into the bed of my truck. I got out of those woods as fast as I could. None of us went back to that job. Word got around and no one would do it. I heard finally they got a crew from out of state, but the second day, they all disappeared. After that, the rich guy just left that building standing. I'm a park ranger stationed in the Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. I've been doing the job for the better part of a decade and was with the U.S. Forest Service before that. It's safe to say that I know my way around the mountains and have seen everything there is to see. At least, I thought so. We have remote satellite stations scattered throughout the more wilderness areas of the park. They don't appear on any park maps, and the other rangers don't usually talk about them. We've had instances of vandalism, and fugitives have even taken up residence within them on multiple occasions. They serve as a form of emergency station, and sometimes personnel from various government agencies use them for extended research projects. Most of them are relatively easy to reach, but a few of them require several days' hike on foot. Every so often, we're directed to check on some of the more remote locations, just to check on supplies, building integrity, things like that. And that's what I found myself doing a few months ago. I was asked to go to the most distant station of them all, half a day's ride on an ATV, plus two days on foot, one way so I brought a fair amount of gear with me. From what I understood, nobody had been there for six months, but a recent flyby from one of our helicopters thought they saw a wisp of smoke in the vicinity of the shelter. It's basically on the side of a mountain, so there's no way the helicopter could land anywhere close by. So I packed up my stuff and headed out on a clear, warm morning. The ride was easy, and I made good time. When I came to the point I would need to leave my ATV, I locked it in a small hut used just for that purpose. Then I began my two-day journey on foot up the mountain path. It was late in the evening of the first day when I had my first experience. It was going to be dark soon, and I was looking for a good place to spend the night with a source of fresh water. Eventually I came upon a mountain stream and followed it up ways until I reached a clearing where I could pitch my tent. Except I found something in the clearing. It was the carcass of a full-grown bull elk. It was fresh, probably less than a day old. The bizarre part was the pair of arrows sticking out from its rump. I've seen things like these in the history books. Stone-tipped heads lashed to a stick of shaved woods with some kind of thin fiber. I'm not a hunter, but I know a bunch of them, and I've seen the gear they use. These arrows didn't come from any kind of modern-day bow that I knew of. I've heard of people who took up primitive-style hunting, but I didn't think anyone came all the way out here to do it. There wasn't anyone around, and there wasn't much I could do about it. I didn't want to stay near the elk in case any nighttime scavengers or predators came along, so I continued another half mile and spent a comfortable night under the stars. The next day I got up and continued on. The trail became a little more difficult to traverse at this point, but I still hoped to reach the station before nightfall. I can't explain it, but for most of the morning I had a weird feeling that I was being watched. Only by what, I didn't know. I found out just after lunch. I had stopped to boil up a freeze-dried meal I had brought. The aroma of teriyaki chicken cut sharply through the scent of the fresh pine trees all around. I was just about to take my first bite when a rustle from a nearby bush and a blur of movement caught my attention. I turned quickly thinking it was an animal and instead came face to face with a man if that's what it can even be called. It was about five feet tall and had a mane of coarse hair across most of its face. It had a tan complexion and a thick brow over its eyes, twice the size of mine. 
Held tightly in its left hand was a long shaft of wood ending in a stone tip, exactly like the one I had seen on the arrow the day before. They each wore garments made from what looked like deerskin. We froze, staring at each other for several moments, until two more similar creatures emerged from behind nearby trees. One held another spear, and the other appeared to be a woman carrying a deerskin sack over her shoulder. They didn't advance any further, and I wasn't sure what to do. I placed my bag of teriyaki on the ground and slowly started pacing back. When I had gone about twenty steps, the woman, hunched forward, loped over to the bag of food I had left and snatched it off the ground. She smelled it a few times, then scooped a hairy handful from the bag, shoving it into her mouth. She let out an excited yelp and jumped up and down a few times. She rushed over to one of the men and handed him the bag. The scenario began playing out again, and then finishing with the third man. The woman turned back to me and let out a string of guttural noises, none of which I understood. I simply stood still, arms raised in the air, palms facing outward. I didn't know what to do. I had my service pistol, but it was in the satchel that I had left sitting next to where I was boiling the food. One of the other men started speaking in that same harsh language. When I didn't respond, he gripped his spear with the other hand and stepped forward a few feet. I was preparing to make a run for it when from the forest behind them came at least a half a dozen calls spoken in that same strange language. They looked at each other and then at me. The two men turned and ran into the forest behind them. The woman stood staring at me for a few moments longer, then dashed forward, grabbed my satchel, and took off into the forest after her friends. I turned and headed back the other way, running until my lungs felt like they were going to burst. I had no choice but to give up the journey to the station. I had no supplies, and besides, I didn't really want to run into those things again. I had a lot of time to think on the way back and decided that I was going to lie. Nobody back at the ranger station was going to believe me. I'm not even sure I believe myself. I told my supervisor that I was driven off by a mother black bear and that I lost all my gear in the process, which made me the laughing stock of all the rangers and earned me the nickname Bear Boy. They ended up pushing the job off for another month and said they're going to send another ranger. I can't explain what or who those things were. Of course I have heard of Neanderthals and cavemen, but they've been extinct for 200,000 years, right? I'm coming to you from upstate Massachusetts. I've had an ongoing experience over the past couple months that I think is right up your alley. I'm a gardener, and due to the area I live in, I usually work for some very rich people. I usually work for the same estate or mansion for as long as they'll have me. It's more predictable than you'd think, honestly. My last job before this one lasted eight years, but my boss moved down south and sold off his mansion. I got fired during the off-season, so no one was really hiring. When I found a job at a new estate, I honestly felt pretty lucky. When I first got hired, I was told that the only people who lived at the estate were a couple in their thirties. The home had been passed down on the husband's side, and it was plopped in the middle of nowhere. They couldn't rent it out because it was too far from the ocean or any attractions. They didn't have any pets or kids. It was just the couple, Mr. and Mrs. Davis, and us staff members. The first problem was that they didn't have enough staff for the place. The Davis's garden was big enough that it could have used five gardeners for the upkeep, but they'd only hired two of us. Normally I would have taken that as a red flag, but, like I said, I needed the money. I started in the fall, so I was thrown headfirst into the planting season. I spent most of those first few weeks just getting rid of dead trees that had overtaken the place. It's normal for a landscaper to miss a tree or two, but it's like the whole garden had died. The garden hadn't been properly taken care of in years. A lot of the estate was like that, too. 
Some areas of the house have been straight up abandoned. We had our staff quarters out back, and those were fine. But the rest of it? Half of the rooms in the main house looked like they hadn't been touched for decades. One night I asked the chef about it since he'd been on the staff the longest. I thought maybe the house had been someone's third or fourth home and they stopped caring about it because no one actually lived there. But he said the house has been the main home for Mr. Davis' family since he'd been born. Things didn't start going downhill until about six months before I was hired. Most of the staff assumed that the money was running out. That was the easiest way to explain such a drastic shift. I believed that explanation, too. Until one night. I stayed out in the garden after dark. I wanted to finish building some plant beds so that I could be done for the week. That way I could spend a few days in the nearest town and see if there was any last-minute work there. I was by myself at the back of the gardens, and I was working right at the edge of the forest line. My flashlight died. Before I could head for the house, I felt someone pressing down on my shoulder. A blast of cold air rushed through me. It was so frigid that it gave me the shakes. I heard a pair of footsteps walking away from me, toward the main house. Now it was dark out, but between the moon and the lights from the mansion, I could see a little bit. And I knew there was no one out there except me. But I could hear those footsteps. It was unmistakable. I couldn't explain it, and I didn't want to. I grabbed my tools and headed back to the staff quarters as fast as I could. I was trying not to make a big deal out of it, but I was shaken up. I knew what I felt. That was only the first time I felt the presence of something else. Over the next few weeks, it kept happening. Something happened every couple of days. I started keeping a journal to record my experience, just so I would know I wasn't crazy. Usually I would be working in the garden or alone in the kitchen, but it didn't really matter. The pattern was the same. The nearest light source would go out. I'd feel someone touching me, like my elbow or a pat on the back, as if they were asking me to move over. Then, a blast of cold. It felt like instant hypothermia. After the fourth or fifth time, I couldn't take it anymore. I asked the other gardener, Jeff, if anything weird had happened to him. At first, he laughed it off like nothing was wrong. I thought maybe I was the only one. But the next time it happened, we were together. And he felt it, too. Apparently, this thing had been freaking Jeff out at the same time it started visiting me. He just didn't want me to think he was crazy. I asked the other staff members and tried to be discreet about it. Two of the housekeepers plus the chef also felt that strange presence. We started working in pairs to make sure no one was ever alone. We didn't know what this thing was or what it could do, after all. It slowed down everyone's productivity, but the Davises either didn't notice or didn't care. One of the housekeepers found a new job and booked it out of there. The rest of us are only sticking it out because we don't have anywhere else to go. It's not like the presence or spirit or whatever it is has really tried to hurt us. But Jeff thinks that if it's a ghost, it's only a matter of time before things escalate. We'll see. I'm trying to find work before the new year because I don't know how much longer I can take this. If things do get worse, or if the spirit becomes more active, I'll call you back in to let you know. I hope it doesn't come to that. I work at this summer home community in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Best I can describe it, it's a nice neighborhood that's kind of like a resort with a swimming pool, golf, hiking trails, spa, and a clubhouse. It's the opposite of a snowbird community because it's completely inaccessible in the winter due to the snow in the mountains. That's where I come in. I work there during the summer when all the residents are around, but I'm the only one who stays through the winter basically making sure the place isn't ransacked when no one else is there. I live in a small house, and I don't do much except wander around in my pickup with the snowplow attachment, just making my presence known. I bring up supplies for the whole winter and just stay from October until April or so. 
alone. It's not as bad as it sounds, since the satellite TV and internet work pretty well. I can communicate with the outside world. I just really can't get anything during those months, so I have to plan in advance. I got a big chest freezer, but I also eat a lot of canned food. I do what I can, but it does all taste pretty much canned. My first winter up there was really quiet. Nothing much happened. I watched a lot of TV and ate a lot of chili and chips. This past winter, though, something odd happened. I usually try to walk around the neighborhood at least once a day, not just because of my job, but I also go nuts in the house all day, unless it's a snowstorm, of course. One of my first days I was there, I went out. It hadn't snowed yet since it was just October, but everyone was gone since you never really know when the snow might come. They go ahead and close the community, just in case. I still had a few winterizing things to do, like drain the pool. I headed down to the pool to do that, walking just for the exercise. I started working on the pool when I heard this strange noise coming from the nearby woods. The community itself is all groomed and landscaped, but the woods really isn't that far away. It is the mountains, after all. So a few yards beyond the grassy area next to the pool was the forest, basically. The noise was like nothing I'd ever heard. Something between a yell and a yodel. Not really scary, but strange. I was partway through draining the pool, so I couldn't really stop. I just watched the woods to see if I could get a look at whatever it was. But I didn't see anything. Just that odd sound. A few weeks later, the first snow came. I stayed inside because I couldn't afford to get lost being on my own and everything. The next day it was sunny, and I decided to go ahead and plow the roads around the neighborhood. I learned by trial and error that if I let the plowing go too long, it would be almost impossible to do it when it snowed again. The snow gets deep and packed in then, which wouldn't be a big deal since no one else was up there, but I couldn't really do my job if I couldn't go around checking on everything. I started up the truck in late morning and started driving around plowing the few roads that snake around the hundred or so homes in the community. While I was plowing, I saw some tracks in the snow off the road. I'd seen tracks from coyotes, deer, even bear, but these tracks were bigger. I couldn't see what they were, though, and I didn't bother to get out of the truck to get a look. I didn't think much more about the tracks until one evening, when I was walking on a newly plowed road. It was just beginning to get dark, and I thought I should head back. As I turned around, I glanced toward the woods and saw something walking, just outside the trees. At first I thought it was a person, and I was scared. There wasn't supposed to be anyone out here. There wasn't any reason for anyone to be here, and if they were here, they had to have hiked or come in by helicopter. You can't use those mountain roads in winter, which is exactly why we closed the neighborhood. As I stared at it, though, I could see it was too big and hairy to be a person. It was covered with hair or fur or something. But it wasn't an ape, because it walked upright. Also, it was pretty far away, but I thought it was taller than a person, maybe eight or nine feet. I remembered the tracks then and wished I had taken a picture of them. I was scared, but then I started to think that it must have been around for a while, and it hadn't hurt me, so why would it now? A few days later, I saw some tracks outside my house. This time, I did take a look at them, and saw they looked like bare human feet, only really big, like size 25 shoes maybe, I don't know. Right on my doorstep was a dead fish. At first I was scared. This thing comes right up to my house and leaves me a dead fish? But then I started to think maybe it was a gift, because it was fresh. And that creature must have gone to some trouble to get it since the lakes and streams were iced over. I took it inside and cooked it, and it was the best thing I'd eaten since fall. A few days later, it brought me a rabbit. That was a little gross, but what the heck. I found a video online on how to clean it and ate that too. It kept bringing me things all winter. Not every day, but 
every few days, and weirdly, I felt less alone. Once spring came, I didn't see any evidence of it anymore. It felt kind of lonely thinking it was gone, but I bet it'll be back this winter. I know I have an NDA about this, but I don't even care anymore. I need to tell somebody this story, and it's not like anyone's going to believe me anyway. They'd just call me crazy. I'm not. I'm... I was a copier technician. You wouldn't think that a technician would need to sign a non-disclosure agreement, but I had one because I often serviced the machines on military bases. That's not the crazy part. This is. A long time ago, I was making a regular service call for three cannon machines. I'm not going to say exactly where I had to go, but it was somewhere in Colorado, outside of Denver. I was working on the machines in an unrestricted area when a secretary came in panicking because the main copier had just broken down as they were running a major job. Some high-ranking officer had a report due in the next hour and the copier had jammed. Could I please kindly save the day? I could work miracles, and on this one, I needed to. What had happened was not a normal paper jam. I practically had to take the whole thing apart to find out that a shred of paper was tripping a sensor and causing it to report the jam as unresolved. Oh, and the secretary accidentally snapped a part when she was pulling papers out. It was a ridiculously small, very delicate part, and without it, the whole machine was just one big dead weight. Now the good news was, I had the part in the kit in my car. The bad news was, I had the part in my car. That meant I would need to be escorted out of the building by security, go to my car, and be escorted back in. The MP that escorted me out was a nice kid. He seemed young, but he also seemed like he had been through some stuff. I figured he was finishing out his time here after coming back from some overseas tour that still haunted him. There was just something about his eyes that got to me. Honestly, I felt bad for him, being so young and having to see things that made him look so haunted. But he was nice enough, in a professional soldier way, as he escorted me out to my work truck and watched me rummage around for my kit and the part I needed. When I straightened up, I happened to look out over the base in the direction of the mountains, and that's when I saw something odd. I was used to seeing uniformed military on the base, but this time I swore I saw a group of men in pale suits. Weird. I found what I needed, grabbed the box, and decided to concentrate on my job and not on what I thought I'd seen. I was on a military base, and I'd signed an NDA for a reason. But just then, a siren started going off. It started low, and then it ramped up until the sound was this long, loud wail. Now, I was no stranger to this base, but I'd never heard that siren before, and I was a little startled. I looked at my guard. He looked like he'd seen a ghost. I could hear his radio crackle. I couldn't make out what was being said, probably because it sounded like a code. I sure couldn't think of another reason for someone to be rattling off a string of numbers. I need you to come with me. Now. That was when I noticed that the MP had freed his sidearm. I went without another word. He got me into the office building where the secretarial pool was visibly nervous. They were all filing into an interior conference room. I got politely urged to join them, and then the door was locked. That's when I noticed that the door was locked from the inside. Weird. At this point, I not only had no idea what was going on, I was getting more and more curious as to what was causing all the trouble. Alarms going off, soldiers coming out of nowhere, the MP freaking out, shelter in place. What was going on? Colorado isn't a stranger to tornadoes, and though it wasn't really the season for them, that didn't mean that one hadn't decided to make an appearance. I figured that was the most reasonable answer. Until I heard the screaming start. I say screaming, but it didn't sound like any kind of human scream. It sounded... To this day, I'm not sure. Part roar, part steam whistle, part shriek. It was the freakiest thing I've ever heard. The lights flickered, and the secretaries huddled around me flinched. Somebody bit off a scream. I looked around, and the weirdest thing was that I saw lots of scared expressions, but not one of those women looked surprised. I don't know how long we sheltered in place, but I do remember hearing shouting outside and a lot of heavy truck sounds. Screeching brakes, the works. 
Whatever was going on, a lot of manpower was being mobilized to deal with it. No way this was because of a tornado. The howl happened again, then it cut off just like that. Like someone had yanked the power cord out of a speaker. It just stopped. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what I should think. But I looked at the faces of the people in that locked conference room with me, and I knew I shouldn't ask. Eventually, someone knocked on the door. The lead secretary stepped up to the door and asked for a passcode before she unlocked the thing. That's how serious whatever had happened was. An officer came into the room and told me to come with him. He debriefed me for an hour before he let me go with a stern warning about prosecution if I didn't abide by the terms of my non-disclosure agreement. At that point, I didn't even care about that. How could I disclose anything that had just happened? I didn't understand any of it. That same MP from before walked me back to my work truck. I didn't even bother to ask if I should fix that copier. Not very professional, but I figured if they didn't ask me to do it, I wouldn't bring it up. Not after all that. The ground was all churned up by my truck. Tire tracks had dug deep into the dirt, and I could still smell the exhaust from the heavy vehicles. The weird thing was that I didn't just smell diesel fumes. There was this heavy smell, like someone had ticked off a couple of skunks and a dog had peed somewhere nearby. It was bad enough that I asked the MP if the site had a skunk problem. He just gave me a blank look and a wave to move along. So I did. It's been years, but I still have questions about what happened that day. What was that scream? Why didn't those secretaries look surprised? What was really going on out there on that base? Maybe I shouldn't care. After all, it was years ago. But there's still some part of me that wants answers. Not that I'll ever get them. I had always dreamed of walking the Appalachian Trail. I wasn't sure if I could do the entire trail, so I began to travel smaller trails across the Appalachians, training myself to tackle the big ones someday. The full trail takes you through something like 14 states, from Georgia to Maine. That's not something you can just hike on a weekend and then be back home after a couple of days. It takes months to travel, and takes time to plan and prepare for. I've always loved being outdoors, and I had traveled a bunch. I was certain with training I could do the whole trail one day. I had started training with my friend Dennis. We'd travel around hiking different trails, sleeping in tents out in the woods, then travel some more. We'd been doing this on and off for months, and it seemed to me that we were making great progress. We decided to take a trip to the Great Smoky Mountains and stay there and train for a few weeks. It's a beautiful area. The mountains are really a fantastic sight. The amount of unspoiled nature is just amazing. We decided to find some of the longest trails and hike as many as well we could while we were down there. It was on our third day down there. We had already traveled a few trails. We were camping out in tents at various campgrounds. We were heading up through one of the long ones, really going uphill. It was rough, but it was great for training. We stopped to rest and drink some water before we continued on the trail. That's when we heard a strange call. It was low, kind of like a grumbling, but it was loud enough it seemed to carry for a long ways. I asked Dennis if it was a stag's call or a moose or something. He was pretty sure moose didn't travel so far south, but he wasn't positive. We were more worried about a black bear than anything else. It called three times, then stopped. We decided it would be best if we kept going up the trail. We were climbing up through the trees and bush when we heard some limbs snapping behind us. We stopped to take a look to see if it was other hikers or if it was an animal in nature. Something was moving through the brush, but we couldn't really see anything. We kept going up and around a rock base, through trees and brush, then wrapped around heading downhill. As we were traveling downhill, we heard something moving above us. Something spooked a bunch of birds. They took to the air, squealing and squawking. I'd never seen anything like it before. That's when the stones came. From somewhere above us, something was throwing stones at us. I couldn't tell if it was just trying to frighten us away or if it had really bad aim. They weren't really big stones, maybe golf ball sized and smaller. We traveled back up the hill to see who was throwing them, and that's when they stopped. 
Something moved to our left, and that's when we saw it. It was just a dark shape moving through the trees and brush. But as it moved downhill, then we got a good look at it. It was gray-furred, going from dark gray to light, almost white at the tips. We knew it wasn't a bear. There were no bears with fur like that. It seemed to travel on two legs, then four. I swear it had horns like a goat. I looked at Dennis and he looked at me, and we decided to move closer towards it. Not our best idea ever, but we needed to see what the hell it was up a little closer. It kept moving through, gaining speed, so we decided to run down as close as we could to it. We were maybe thirty or forty feet away. It turned its head and we got a better look. It bellowed at us, that same low grumbling sound we had heard back on the trail. Its face was goat-like with horns and everything. Its eyes had the weird rectangle pupils that goats have, but its teeth seemed more human than goat. It stood on its hind legs with a log in hand and beat the tree next to it. Me and Dennis started to back up, going back up the hill backwards, really slowly. It bellowed again, then threw the log towards us. It smashed against a rock maybe five feet away from me. That's when Dennis began to run, and I decided to follow him. We ran up and through the trees and brush, over stone and dirt, pushing branches out of our way. Still, some of them cut our faces as we ran past. I didn't know if the thing was chasing us or not, but I wasn't going to stop and find out either. At some point, we stopped near the end of the trail. We noticed that there were two park ranger trucks parked there. We ran up to the trucks and told the rangers there was something on the trail. At first, they thought we were talking about bears, but then we slowed down and told them what we saw. They came with us, back to the spot where we had seen the thing. We showed them where the thing had thrown the log and how it was smashed against some rocks. We walked down to where it was moving through the trees and brush, and that's where we found weird tracks. It's tracks. They took pictures of the tracks and wrote down what we told them. I don't know if they really believed us, though. They may have thought we were putting them on. I don't know. I'll never forget what we saw, though. I've decided against traveling the Appalachian Trail now. Dennis has come to the same conclusion. I think there's some kind of entity haunting my house. I got a divorce a few months ago, and I've been back living with my mom since the split. I wanted to be independent and move out as soon as I could, so I jumped at the opportunity to buy my house. I was surprised to see the price was so low, but it had been on the market for a while, and it's not exactly in a booming area. It was perfect for me, though. Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, with a finished basement, and an attic with this beautiful circular window that I thought would be an amazing office space. I moved in and started setting it up to my taste, excited to not to have to cater to anyone else's design ideas for once. I decorated my room and the two other bedrooms for my kids, who I have joint custody of. It all started with the small things, like keys being misplaced and cabinets being open when I thought I closed them. Now, I have ADHD, so it's easy for me to see these things and think that I left a cabinet door open or put my keys in the freezer so I really didn't think anything of it at the time. I started feeling like something was in my room with me when I slept. It was a strange sensation, but I could feel eyes on me. Part of me just thought that was nerves from the new house, though. One night I was sleeping, and I woke up suddenly when I heard the TV in the living room turn on. It was loud and playing some action movie with tons of guns and screaming. I got up and slowly walked to the living room and turned it off. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and walked through the house, but I didn't see anything. Honestly, I couldn't explain it, so I ignored it. A few days later, I felt like something grabbed my ankle while I was asleep, but I wasn't sure if maybe it was a dream that had felt super realistic, so I brushed it off. The first time I realized something supernatural was happening was when I was sitting on my couch watching TV, and my basement door opened. It was closed. I know 100% that it was. I have a cat that likes to try and hide down there, so when I use it, I always make sure it's fully closed. I walked to the basement door and pulled the string for the light at the top of the stairs and looked down. I didn't see anything, 
but I heard a quiet tapping noise. If I had been doing laundry, I'd have thought it was my dryer, but I knew it was empty. I walked down the stairs, pretty anxious about the situation, but when I got down there, I didn't see anything, and the tapping stopped. I walked back to the stairs and got to the top of the stairwell. I saw a figure. I screamed and the door slammed shut. I ran up the steps to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. I kept pressing against it, hoping it would open, but it never did. I didn't have my phone with me. I'd left it on the couch when I went to look to begin with. I felt trapped and cornered in my own home. I definitely saw someone or something at the top of the stairs, though I couldn't make out any features. Now they were upstairs doing God only knows what in my house. Every now and then I heard thudding and thumping. I heard glass shatter once. With everything happening, I kind of thought it sounded like a robbery. I didn't know how long I would be trapped down there, but I knew my kids were due to be dropped off in the morning, so at the very least they would see my car in the driveway and go inside. Then I could scream for help. But the door creaked open before morning. I don't know how long I was down there, and I was honestly terrified to leave. But I needed to grab my phone and keys and get out. I snuck upstairs and saw that my kitchen was turned inside out. Food from the fridge was tossed around, glass was broken, cabinets were open, cupboards were emptied. My living room looked ransacked, too. I grabbed my phone and car keys, and thankfully my cat was just waiting by the door. I got in my car, drove a few blocks away, and called the police. They came over shortly after and looked around the house. There was no sign of a break-in, and they genuinely didn't think it looked like anyone else had been in the house. Doors and windows were locked from the inside, and they didn't see other signs of someone else being present. I felt insane. They framed it almost like it was me doing all of this, like it was a desperate plea for attention. But I know what I saw that night. I cleaned everything up and prepared to stay at my mom's house for a few days. I just didn't feel safe there anymore. No one really believed me when I told them what I saw, which is honestly one of the most disheartening feelings I've ever experienced. I did some research online to try and figure out what it could be, and I'm hoping someone will recognize elements of this story and tell me they've gone through something similar so I can get some answers. I've reached out to the people I bought the house from to see if they've experienced anything like it. I haven't heard anything from them yet, but I'd venture to say it might have been why they were so motivated to sell in the first place. <laughs> 